I'm going to pray for you this morning, and then we're going to jump in. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4, I believe, chapter 4, chapter 6, I'm sorry, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, and if you have your Bibles or if you have the Bible app, you can, you can scan the QR code, and you can follow along there. We're going to be talking about the unseen world, or another uh, way to title this message is Open Our Eyes, and so we're going to be talking about things we can't see and how it affects our daily lives. Let's pray, and then we'll jump in this morning. God, thank you so much for Scripture. Thank you so much for a church family that believes in the power of Scripture. Uh, God, we, we trust you. Uh, we put our service in your hands. Uh, my prayer right now is that the Spirit would give us, um, uh, give us wisdom, also give us knowledge that we'd be able to understand what you have for us today. God, I, I pray that you would fill us and that you would point us to truth as you've promised in your word. Thank you so much for pointing us to Jesus and drawing us closer to Jesus as we uh, take steps to obey and follow him. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, if you're new to Bethel or if you've just started coming to Bethel, one of the, one of the things you can learn pretty quickly is that we, um, our, our focus is singular. We focus on Jesus. That's our, that's our main focus is finding him, following him. Uh, so everything that we say, everything that we do is always Jesus-focused. Um, and I know that's what church should be about, but that's not always the case. Uh, so today we're going to read an Old Testament passage, but we're going to see how it relates to the actual spiritual battle that's going on all around us. Uh, last week, uh, we got a cool display here in Oklahoma. I had some pictures and I forgot to put them on the screen, sorry. Um, but uh, I don't know if anybody got to see the, the Northern Lights. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, we have one person. I don't know. I guess I'm just a nerd. I don't know what happened, but I was sitting in my house, minding my own business. It was like 10 o'clock, and I had a friend text me and say, hey, did you see the Northern Lights? And he sent me a picture, and I was like, no, that's not in Oklahoma. And he goes, yeah, it's tonight. So I run outside, and I'm looking up in the sky, and I'm like, where do I look? And so I texted him, where do I look? And it was like, dot, 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 north. (laughs) Duh. Okay. I didn't get it. So I ran around the house, and I looked north, and I was like, there's nothing there there's nothing. It's just the sky. And he goes, you got to pull out your phone. If you'll look through your phone lens, you'll see it. And so did anybody see it through their phone lens? One or two. Okay, got a few more hands. Okay. All right. So here's the thing that was surprising about the Northern Lights. It was neat. I mean, I I actually will admit I've always wanted to see it. You could see the the rays dancing around on your phone. I got a couple cool pictures. You could actually edit the pictures to take away uh, kind of all the other stuff and just see the Northern Lights all the way in Oklahoma. Um, I I thought it was cool. I really liked it. But you could not see it just by looking. Now, I want to go to Alaska one of these days and see it bounce across the sky. You know, I don't know how real that is. I don't, until I see it, I'm not sure. Uh, but I've seen pictures. Now that I've seen my pictures, I'm wondering what people actually see. Okay, has anybody ever seen the actual Northern Lights? Is it that cool? Yeah. Okay, all right, okay. So I'll, I'll believe you guys if you guys have seen it with your own eyes. I've never seen it. Uh, Christy and I went on a cruise last, no, two years ago. I don't know how long ago that was. And it followed us. And I was like, this is fake. It's not real. You know, and I want to see it with my own eyes. Here's the deal. Because of a camera lens and because of a filter on the lens, we could see something that wasn't there. Here's exactly how the unseen world is, because the unseen world is a lot like the northern lights that we got to appreciate uh, last week, is that until you see with the correct lens or the correct filter, you're not going to be able to see it. The phone, the lens on the phone allowed me to see what could not be seen with my eyes only. Uh, Now more than ever in our history, we understand there are things happening without us being able to see it with our own eyes. There are things going on in our world right now, technology-wise. There's no telling what our kids are going to experience, grandkids are going to experience, but there's the augmented reality that you can like step into. Or it's all this like illusion of what's going on around you. But it's like there is more and more and more. It makes sense to us how the unseen world is visible with a little bit of technology. Here, here's when we look into Scripture. There is another reality that's all around us, and it's a spiritual reality. It's something that's happening more so than we would like to admit. There is a battle going on, and it's a battle between good and evil. And, you know, uh, spoiler alert, the, he, the enemy does not win. Jesus wins. He won 2,000 years ago, and he's wrapping things up, and eventually we're going to be with God for eternity. But here's where the unseen world happens, when we ignore it. When we ignore the consequence of the unseen world, we're susceptible to fall into the traps of the enemy. And we'll actually miss out on the freedom that we find in the good news of Jesus. I want to talk about Scripture for a minute because one of the things that we say 
over and over and over again here at Bethel is that you need to be in Scripture every single day. It's a resource that's in your hands that you can read every single day. And I'm not a legalist person. I love freedom. But if I could say one thing that's super legalistic, you need to be in Scripture every single day whether you feel like it or not. It is a good thing for you to be in God's Word because God's Word is the one thing that will change your life. You need to be in it. And so when we read Scripture, the Bible or the whole holy word of God. You, it's got several names. It's the contained words of God. When you read scripture, it is a supernatural book that talks about supernatural things. And the, the, the idea of a supernatural book, there's no surprise that there are supernatural things that show up in this supernatural book. You read from the beginning of the the first page all the way to the end. There's some incredible things that are said, some that seem so otherworldly, and others, like we've been walking through the story of Elijah and Elisha, where this prophet of God asked God to not let it rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he asked for the rain to come back, and the rain came back. And then at the very end of his life, this chariot of fire took him up to heaven. Now, there are people that want to explain away the supernatural with some kind of scientific answer. But here's the reality as we read through Scripture. There's a reality of miracles that happen. There's a reality that things that should not happen physically do happen. And so the the word supernatural simply means this. It's attributed to some force beyond scientific understanding or the laws of nature. And here's the... If we try to bring in our experience into a natural mindset, we're going to miss out on a lot of what Scripture has for us. Scripture is a supernatural book that talks about a supernatural God, and the most most profound supernatural experience that happened in Scripture was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you look at 2,000 years ago, this world changed because one man died and three days later walked out in the power of God from the grave. That is a supernatural thing that happened that cannot be explained by nature or by the laws of nature, and this whole book is about a supernatural God. Now, several times over the past few years, I've talked about this subject, and I want to give just a little little context and also a little warning about this particular topic. A lot of people want to study more and more and more about the enemy, to kind of understand the enemy. Well, Scripture never tells us to understand or study the enemy. The Scripture tells us to draw close to Jesus, to submit to Him, to give our lives to Him. And so I want to warn you, the more you expose yourself to darkness, your flesh will want to go and know more and more and more, and you'll fall right into His trap. If we draw close to Jesus, if we follow in Jesus' footsteps, the enemy can't do anything to us. And so Scripture talks about these supernatural characters, God, angels, the devil, demons, miracles, and miraculous events. But it's not just a book of stories. What sets Scripture apart is Scripture is actually a history of what actually happened with real people. And so when you read Scripture, it's not a fable. It's not a cartoon. It's not anything that's created by man. It's actually, these are events that actually happened. In our series of Elijah and Elisha, uh, we've seen meals multiplied. We've seen oil multiplied. We saw the chariot of fire. We've seen some crazy things happen with this guy named Elisha. Uh, Last week, if you were here, we just read one passage about him um, cursing these young guys. And these bears came out and mauled him. I, I, I don't know what to do with all that. But it's talking about this guy, Elisha, that understood there was more in the world than what he could see. Scripture is the most beneficial resource and the most neglected resource in the Christian family. It is something that we need to open every day. We need to get in it. We need to let it get in us because the word will change us if we let it in our lives. Paul tells us in Romans about the invisible qualities, the eternal power, and the divine nature of God that are revealed in Scripture, the Word of God. So get into God's Word so that it can get into you. We're going to walk through this passage in 2 Kings chapter 6, and it's a supernatural passage rooted in the natural, in history, with a king named Aram, and a uh, king of Aram, and then also uh, Elisha the prophet. So we're going to read there in verse 8. It says, When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officials and say, We will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. 
And so first off, we see the king of Aram, he was going to go to war. There was a time in history where there was wars that would happen. Normally, the kings would go out to battle, and he would do a strategy plan, and he would say, okay, this is the best place. We're going to go attack the king of Israel. We're going to take his land. We're going to kill people, whatever it's going to be. Now, look what happened in verse 9. It says, but immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So here's what you can read in this particular passage is that Elisha directly heard from God to warn the king of Israel. The Israel was divided into two uh, nations. We had the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, and this was particularly the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And he said, go warn him, don't go to that place. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on alert there frustrating the plans of King Aram, obviously. Verse 11, the king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? Yes. Obviously, that would be the question. I kind of laugh a little bit because I, I can't help but read this in 2024. And so in the context we live in today, it says, it is not us, my lord, the king. One of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. 2024, we just say Alexa or Google or um, Siri. That's what we would say. Wow, tough crowd. Okay, so <laughs> here's the thing. What's been said in private of the bedroom was told to Elisha through God, which was then told to the king of Israel. This is like an amazing event. And so if we think about this, there was privacy, there was plans that were made, and yet the king of Israel would find out through the prophet of God, through Elisha. This obviously frustrated the plans of the king. Now, here's what the king did. The king actually believed that the prophet was the one giving this message because he says, verse 13, go out, go out and find, find out where he is so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha's at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. Now, what's funny to me is that Elisha obviously knew that the king of Aram was coming. I mean, he knew all the plans about them attacking different places. Obviously, God didn't leave uh, Elisha by, in surprise. He knew he was coming, and he goes to sleep like a baby. Look at the next verse, verse 15. It says, when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Obviously, what are we supposed to do? Now, I don't know particularly what's going on in your life right now, but there are moments where we act like this servant. We say, oh no, what am I going to do? What's going on? Uh, things are out of control. God has protected me up until this point, and now he's not going to. I don't know what the servant thought, but here's how Elisha responded to him. Verse 16, don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. And then Elisha prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Now, just a few years earlier, Elijah was taken away um, in a chariot of fire. And I wonder if maybe this was the captain and he brought the, all the armies of heaven and surrounded the enemy around the people that were in the city of Dothan. Now, I, I'm curious about this because I think many times we see things that we see, which is normal, and when things get upset or unrested or, or unsettled, we end up saying, oh, no, what are we going to do? And God is simply saying, don't fear. Don't fear. There are more on our side than on their side. We're going to go through this next section fairly quickly. It's comedic to me a little bit. Uh, because things happen that are different. Elisha is a kind of a different kind of character. And he says here in verse, eight, in verse 18, we read, as the Arameans' armies advanced toward him, Elisha prayed, O Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them blind. That's not normally what we read in Scripture. We're always asked, God's always opening the eyes, but here he blinds the eyes. And it's because Elisha asked him. I'd be afraid to be around Elisha because anything he asks 
he gets. I mean, we, we see this over and over again in his life. He's a little different. And so when, he's, when these guys are coming, he goes, Lord, blind their eyes, he made them blind. Then Elisha went out and told them, you have come to the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Follow me and I'll take you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to the city of Samaria. Here, really interesting. I mean, there's this like Jedi move on them. It's like, they're not the drones you're looking for. I mean, that's really what it says. This is not the prophet you're looking for. I'll take you to him. Blinded eyes. How is this possible? This is a supernatural thing that happened in the city. Then he took them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha prayed, now, Lord, open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they discovered they were in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw this, it's like, all right, the enemy is here. I'm surrounding him. My father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Of course not, Elisha responded. Do we kill prisoners of war, give them food and drink and send them home again? to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and sent them home to their master. After that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. I would do. Um, I don't know how they explained this event to the king of Aram when they went back. They're wiping their faces after the good feast they had, and they try to explain we were blind, and then we were in Samaria, and then how do you explain this? They stayed away from Israel that day going forward. It's worthwhile when we look at this passage that a single man of God, yielded to God, can become so important in the invisible war that the early enemy king finds it worthwhile to send an army against him. So the army is sent against this one man because in the invisible war, this is a big deal. And in the spiritual realm, a great number of fallen angels and demons will be deployed to the prince of the world in order to frustrate the plan of God. This has never stopped. This is something that is ongoing. There is a massive difference, though, and there's three things that I want us to note before we continue. Most of us today have a misunderstanding of what the spiritual world or spiritual beings are in our world, and it's based on misunderstanding. Hollywood, movies, fables have painted a picture of who the enemy is and we've fallen right into that trap. It's like she twisted the reality of the enemy. Legend has turned into the boogeyman. And most of us think that we would recognize the enemy if we saw him today. That's actually not true. What happened on the cross sent the spiritual world into hiding and in disguise. Before Jesus and before he died on the cross, the spiritual darkness and demonic activity was totally normal and on public display. But something happened at the cross that changed the whole conversation. Today, uh, the majority of the church around the world celebrates something called Pentecost, the day where the Holy Spirit came on the earth. Something happened that dramatically shifted the spiritual battle when Jesus died, rose from the dead, and the Spirit of God came to live here. What we find in Scripture is God is not just an idea that makes us feel better. He's a real, he's a living, he's an all-powerful creator that is divinely interested in your day-to-day life. That is why he sent his son Jesus, and that's why he's drawing you in to him. And here's what we know about spiritual things. Here's what we know about darkness and light. Depending on what you feed and how you feed it is what you'll be aware of. Have you ever gone out looking for a car and say you want to buy this car and you've never seen it on the road, but after you look at the car and test drive the car, it's everywhere? There's something about our attention that once we put our attention on something, we see it everywhere. That's exactly what happens in the spiritual world. When I begin to focus my attention on it, the more I'm aware of what goes on around me. But the warning is, just like I said in the beginning, we have to be careful to feed our lives with Jesus not with the enemy. We need to study more about him and more about Jesus and let him fill our lives because the enemy only wants to trap you. We're first introduced to him in Genesis chapter 3, and from Genesis chapter 3 on, he is the dark and sinister character throughout the scriptures that wants to thwart the mission of God. He actually is the representative of the spiritual rebellion against God's kingdom. The Satan, the deceiver, the tempter, Lucifer, the enemy has a legion of lesser beings that work to, uh, to get against the, the will of God. We find in Scripture 
that a third of the heavenly beings that God created chose to follow Lucifer when he rebelled against God. Now, there are less teachings about demonic activity and influence in Scripture than we'd like to believe. There is not a lot of information. There are a few passages here and there. When Jesus came, it says they cast out evil or unclean spirits. But you cannot find like rank and title of a lot of, a lot of angelic beings. That's just not there. Because we have a fascination with the supernatural. We end up elevating the supernatural. And what Jesus says is don't get distracted with that. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The enemy, Satan, he's the adversary. He's not for anything. He's against everything. He wants you to be blind. He wants you not to believe. He wants you to ignore God. He wants you to have no power. He is not for you. He is a liar. He is a deceiver. He wants you to be self-sufficient, and he wants to destroy you. Our hearts are easily swayed toward darkness. That's why we have to choose to make good decisions because the bad ones come naturally. We simply do what this fallen world tells us to do. And the Satan... The enemy never asks for permission. He always takes because he's a thief. He wants to kill. He wants to steal. He wants to destroy. The enemy is not our focus. God is our focus. Christ is our focus. He is not caught off guard by the evil in this world. He set a plan in motion to redeem the world and humanity from the grasp of the enemy. Colossians 2, chapter 13, I want us to, to see the power of the good news. It's a story about Jesus. It says, verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive in Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. This is the good news in a capsule in a few verses. The first thing is that we are dead. Like we are dead because our sin and our sinful nature. It has taken away us away from spiritual life. Our sinful nature comes to us naturally. We simply are born and we have a sinful nature. Then it continues to say, then God made us alive. He didn't just come and just grab us and make us alive. He sent Jesus. He sent Christ. And through Christ, he made us alive and he took care of our sin, like our guilty sentence. He forgave it. And and here's how a lot of times court systems work is that there's a guilty charge and then all this stuff is here, but it's kind of still there in the records. Here's what Jesus did is that he canceled the record of the charges against us. It says that he took that guilty charge in God's heavenly court and he nailed it to the cross so that the enemy no longer has any grounds of charge against us. All my spiritual debt has not only been paid, it's been canceled and it's been forgotten on the cross. There are no more charges against me. The cross is the payment and the resurrection is the sealed statement of proof to God's power in my life. Colossians 2.20 says this, you have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. That's the sealed promise of God of the gospel. So when I focus my attention on him, when, when God shows up in my life, my life begins to change because I begin to care. I'm no longer blind by the things of this world. I'm no longer uh, caught up in the system of the world. I'm actually rebellious against the powers of this world. I want to go back to 2 Kings chapter 6 in verse 16. This is what Elisha says to his servant. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. And then he prayed that God would open his eyes for him to be able to see. And you remember what happened, opened his eyes, and then he saw all around him the chariots of fire and horses surrounding them. So this morning, there's a few things. Some of us are afraid. Some of us are afraid of all the things that are happening around us in our world. And what we learn in this scripture is we don't need to be afraid because the fear that the enemy is winning is a false reality. He is not winning. Some of us have blinders on. We have chosen to ignore our spiritual reality, have chosen to reject Christ's gift of salvation. And some of us need, need God's vision like an open heart and an open mind. 
God will never force us to obey him. He always invites us to follow him. He'll never force you to follow him. He's a gentle father. He's a loving savior. He is a father who wants to protect you and love you and guide you and empower you and walk with you and strengthen you and encourage you and uphold you. But we need to ask him to be a part of our lives. He never forces us. We need to ask him to empower us. So when we resist God, there are several things that happen. When we don't feed our spiritual life, our our life to follow Jesus, there's a few things that happen. One is that we hear less. We, We hear less from God because we're shutting off the spiritual life. Some of us feel less. We no longer feel the connection with the Father. Some of us do less. And in the end, we fear less, meaning we have less awe in God and His power in our lives. 1 John chapter 4 says this, to close. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won the victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Today, no matter what's going on in your life, we can fear not because the one who's in us is greater than the one who's in the world. You may feel like the enemy is coming against you, but there's more on your side than on their side. It may feel like you're heading into a season of darkness, but there's more on our side than on their side. You may realize that you're kind of losing the battle to temptation and sin, but you need to know this, that there are more on our side than on their side. Let me pray for us this morning. Now, this morning as we wrap up and as we head into worship, we want to remember that greater is he who is in us The spirit of the living God is in us. So what can we fear? But I think like the servant to Elisha, sometimes there is a fear of what we see. And we forget what's unseen. We forget the world around us that that you are holding together in your heavenly court. God, I pray that today that our church would continue to find you, to follow you, to draw close to you, And God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that today they would give their life to you, knowing that you have canceled the penalty of their debt, that you have nailed it to the cross and you've forgotten the charges. It's up to us to say yes. So I pray that today, God, you would allow someone to say yes. God, I also pray today for freedom for those that feel the oppression of the enemy. We know that if we focus on him, the more real he'll be. And what we want to do is focus on Jesus because Jesus has paid it all. It's all to him that we owe. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for scripture that in it we find freedom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.